here at the Olympic Trials Marathon with Camille and way over there are Luke and Jared that are helping film too. We set up at multiple places here so we can see the runners come by and measure their running mechanics. So we'll get them six times throughout the race, see how they're moving, see what's going on with running mechanics, how they change as the race progresses. And we do have our favorites. Who are we cheering for today? We're cheering for Connor Mance and Clayton Young. That's right. So BYU Cougars out here is a whole bunch of them. We're going to give you some running mechanics information as we go through the day too. I've been looking at running mechanics and trying to understand how to make elite runners faster through how they move for a lot of years now. Thought it'd be good today while we look at the Olympic trials to think about stride length. So one of the things that we get asked a lot is what should the best stride rate be for someone? And we hear numbers like 180 steps a minute and so on. The graph that I can show you here lets us see that from the 100 meters through the 10K has a whole lot of different things going on and there's only very few people that are actually running at 180 steps per minute in that group. When we're just out on slower paced running, the average is usually in the 170s, maybe close to 180, but it's very speed dependent. During my time at Oregon State University, I worked with Jerry Smith, who was one of the really good researchers of running mechanics. And we focused on how stride length changes throughout a long run and whether it's optimal or not. So here we can see some of the data. We had runners go at a certain pace on the treadmill while matching the cadence of a metronome. We knew what their preferred running strides were, and then we looked at what happened when they went away from that. You can see the energy cost measured through our oxygen measures shows that they start using a lot more energy to run when they went away from their preferred rate. We did that measurement early on in the run, and then we had them go for one hour at a pretty hard pace for them. Here's the full data set showing that we had people that were matching up their preferred and most economical strides nearly exactly. And then as they got fatigued near the end of the run, a lot of them ended up with longer strides, a lower rate, but notice how the most economical stride shifted right with it. So they ended up matching and giving uh, us knowledge that runners naturally figure out what the preferred stride length is, what works for them, and whatever's going on inside the body with joint attachment, skeletal structure, and so on, seems to lead to a preferred rate that works for that individual for the condition of their body at the time. As we've been watching the Olympic trials today, you may be wondering, do all of these runners naturally choose the best stride rate and length for the speeds that they were going? Well, back in the lab, we've done some testing over the years, looking at the rested state, the fatigued state on level ground running, uphill running. We've also looked at experienced versus inexperienced runners. And in every single case, every person we've tested and other labs that have looked at similar uh, examinations have found that everybody just naturally chooses the stride rate and length that is optimal for them in terms of running economy. So we assume out here today, everyone's doing it exactly right for stride length and rate to get the best performance they possibly can. We believe the reason why people do naturally have this ability to choose the stride rate that's gonna be optimal is dealing with the stiffness of the leg. If you remember back in your physics class, you might remember a ceiling with a spring and a weight on top. And as you pull it down and let go, it oscillates at what we call a natural frequency. Now, if we take that and rotate it upside down and have the mass of the person on top, the leg working as the spring, and then the ground here, that same occurrence also happens. Now, the factors that determine what that natural frequency is would be the length of the spring, the stiffness of the spring, and the weight on top. The muscle activity is a large contributor to what determines the stiffness of that spring. The length and the mass are relatively fixed. So if we activate our muscles a certain way, there's going to be a stride rate that feels comfortable and natural to us that for economy's sake, we just leave alone. Now you've already seen the results of the Olympic trials. But if you're a BYU Cougar fan, things went really, really well. We now have Connor and Clayton as our newest Olympians for uh, the U.S. team. On the Canadian side, we also have Rory Linkletter, who was a cross-country and track teammate with Connor and Clayton, made it for Canada. It'll be so exciting to see how our runners do there in the Olympic Games. 
The data we get from today will be used to analyze running technique on the men and the women throughout the race at six different time points where we'll be able to see how running mechanics are changing between men and women and faster and slower runners and some other conditions that we're interested in. So I'll have some information on that for you at a later date and hopefully I'll see you in Paris.